My name is Kevin Navertel, and I am a political science professor at Marine Valley. I'm also the democracy commitment coordinator and my fellow colleagues and I um, have been communicating uh, furiously over the last several days to try to organize this event. And I'm, I'm really grateful to them for sharing their time and expertise um, and in such a last minute fashion. So who we plan to have with us today um, is history professor uh, Josh Fulton, history professor Jim McIntyre, um, developmental math and geology professor Jason King, and uh, jack of all trades, uh, Mary Fafleese Dunkel, who is a historian, a political scientist, a sociologist, uh, study abroad coordinator. I don't know. I think she does a little bit of everything at Marine. So here she is. Uh, Mary, can you hear us? And Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> Finally. Sorry about that. So maybe the... Um, um, cyber activity by Russia has already started and they're trying to influence our, our panel discussion today. So, as everyone I'm sure has heard in the news um, and then been able to watch um, uh, last week, Russia invaded Ukraine. And as I was saying earlier, the five of us wanted to try to put this into context to try to explain what's happened. Um, to share our own personal insights on, on what we think has happened and why. Um, so with that being said, um, we're going to each start with about five minutes or so of an overview individually, and then we're going to open it up for questions and comments among the panelists and with the um, participants today. I see there's already about 40 people logged in, and so we will definitely have an opportunity for people to uh, make comments, ask questions, um, in our hour and 15 minutes today. So to begin, Jason, um, would you like to start? Me? Oh, okay. Or... Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, it feels to me like Putin has always been seen as this like cerebral chess player, like this guy whose motives were completely unknowable to us. But in a lot of ways, he's telegraphed every move that he's made, and he's been very clear about what he's doing and why. The first one is he wants to restore the Soviet sphere of influence. This is one of those time-honored traditions since essentially Peter the Great at the Battle of Poltava, but really kind of formalized in Bestashev, Ruman, and Catherine the Great's idea. This idea that Russia wants space to its west to protect itself from Western powers. This is, of course, not one that's supported very much by those Western countries like Poland or Ukraine, that their appearance seems to come in and out of the fog of history. The other one is that he wants to prey on essentially the international community to attempt to divide the U.S. from the European Union and with Western European members of NATO and from the United States. I feel like Russia's playing a weak hand with this. But it's all in. It's got a petrostate state economy with weak allies. It has its own version of NATO. Many of the countries of which are not coming to its aid, like Kazakhstan. It's got foreign reserves it's been hoarding, mostly in renminbi and in gold. It's got an army of about a million soldiers, about four times the size of Ukraine's, but many of them are semi-trained. It has 10 times the spending. And Itar TASS reported yesterday, this is the 27th, that 4,300 casualties have already been mounted in Russia versus Ukraine's casualties of about 350. I think most people suspect that Russia, if this continues this way, will continue to win. And the reason that it will is that Putin has never been stopped before by sanctions. He views what's going on right now as being a slap on the wrist to his greater political ambitions. And I think that without something else happening, this is essentially the way that this is going to go as well. And I'm done. Can't hear you, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin, well, can't hear you. We're learning at this, right? It's only been two years of doing WebEx. Um, I, I'm laughing because we were talking how we each have at least an hour that we would like to share. So, Jason, awesome job of of being concise, and I should remind everybody that tomorrow uh, for, for Marine Valley faculty and staff, we have Learning College Day, and I know that Jason, um, you have an event on Ukraine, and I think you're with uh, Mike Renahan. Is that I am. 
I and am. You should do it. It'll be fun. I as plan fun on as it. The war can be. So you can give a fuller version tomorrow. And I know that Jim McIntyre is also having an event tomorrow on Ukraine as well. So thank you, Jason. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary. And Mary, I can share that PowerPoint if you would like me to. That'd be great. Uh, thank you, sir. I would appreciate it. Yeah, so to uh, thank you, Jason, for starting us off. And, um, you know, this is, I've been kind of calling this uh, Putin's party and he'll cry if he wants to. Um, because, you know, I've always, as I was saying to my colleague Kevin last week, I've always considered Putin to be a rational actor. And this just this whole thing, I, I kept saying, once again, I was wrong. So I kept saying, he's not going to do this. He's not going to do this. You know, he's just, this is saber rattling, typical Putin stuff. Um, but he's gone ahead and done this. So what has changed? And I find Putin to be a fascinating figure. And as, as Jason says very well, he does kind of broadcast what he's going to do. Um, but a lot of it is, is, is also like to, to kind of put himself in a position of, of, of power as much as he can. So a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, you know, he had the Security Council meeting last week, not the UN Security Council meeting, but his own personal Security Council meeting where the members of his own council looked like hostages. Uh, that they're being like, like in a hostage video where they, they didn't quite seem to know kind of how to respond to him, which says to me that a lot of them were not quite sure what they should say. So this seems to be kind of coming from him. This is a party of one. This is his party. Um, and there seems to be a lack of support even from within his own administration. Of course, they're kind of afraid to say that out loud, um, but it, 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 it's rather concerning. Now, the biggest thing, a couple of things I want to mention, going back to... Uh, 1999, when when Putin first came into power, and I of course had to include um, you know a picture of, of 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 Putin without his shirt on because you know of course he loves to have his his shirt off and show him as, as powerful. And this is all posturing on his part, right, to show how powerful he is. Um, but he was furious about what he considered to be the emasculation of Russia at the end of the Cold War, the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, and the thing that scared the bejesus out of him the most is what occurred in 1999 when NATO bombed Kosovo. Now, NATO, for those of you, I think most of you understand what Kosovo, what NATO is, but it's North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, and it's it's basically a collective uh, treaty, like almost like a security bargain. I'll, I'll, we got your back, you got our back. If one country is attacked, right, this was created in 1949 with the idea that if one country gets attacked, and of course, who was this country? The Soviet Union at the time, um, then the other countries come to, it, come to its aid. Um, and of course, uh, NATO has survived the breakup of the Soviet Union and was kind of floundering without a role in the 1990s. Then comes the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, and NATO then intervenes. And when Putin saw that NATO was willing to bomb, even though the Russians came to the Clinton administration in the 90s and said, hey, can we talk to you about this? And they said, no, you really have nothing to say. To him, that was a pivotal moment. This was the United States saying, we are, we've got this, we're empowered by ourselves, Russia, you've got nothing to say. And so it's been his determination since then to restore Russia to its rightful place as he views it. And that is to, as, as Jason also mentioned, kind of having that buffer zone that Russia's always been seeking, having been invaded multiple times in the 20th century. Um, but this, this major concern of NATO encroaching in on them. And if you look at that map that, that Kevin has thoughtfully, uh, put, thank you, sir, um, you're, you'll see that in Europe, the, the lighter purple countries are countries that joined um, NATO uh, after 1987. So countries like Poland and uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that joined in 2004. So from his perspective, the idea of, of like NATO seems to be encroaching on his territory and surrounding him, he wants to have as much, as much of a buffer between himself and the West as, as possible. Um, and this is, this, is, this is nothing new. But he looked at it as if NATO could take action to bomb Serbia, then they could bomb him. And so that was very much concerning for him. And I could the other stuff I could get into about you know his his other power, but I think I've already exceeded probably my five minutes. So I will uh, I'll come back into that stuff later. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, Josh, would you like to go next? Sure, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well. You know, I think like many uh, over the last week, uh, we've all been sort of shocked and uh, kind of watching, you know, these events. And I know, you know, like many, I spend, you know, my day is sort of checking, you know, everything as, as possible as fast as I can. Uh, but in terms of things that maybe sort of stand out to me about this particular moment or things that this makes me think of with sort of the context of history, 
Uh, the first two in terms of the context of history would be uh, the Ukrainian independence movement in 1917 uh, and then eventually the famine that occurs in Ukraine in 1932 and 33 uh, as it comes to their relationship uh, with with Russia and this long arc of questions of identity and what Russians and sort of others sort of think of Ukraine and, and, and all of that. Uh, you know, in that period of 1917, in the last years of uh, the First World War, right, you, of course, have the Russian Revolution, then you have the internal civil war there, but you had an effort on the part of many, of course, in Ukraine to establish an independent nation. Uh, and that, of course, uh, was uh, defeated, right, that, of course, is defeated. Uh, now, in the 1920s and in early, early 1930s, right, you, of course, have a number of, of difficulties in this new Soviet Union. Stalin, of course, emerges sort of on top after these series of, of conflicts and all of this. And by the time you get to the end of the 20s and early 30s, you sort of have this sense of, uh, you know, his industrialization and collectivization and all the five-year plans and everything. But you also have this sense of in centralizing uh, that that Stalinism, right? That Stalinization needs to to take place. That there there's a price to pay, uh, or there should be a price to pay for having gone against uh, Russia and gone against uh, Stalin. Uh, and this occurs to the Ukrainian people uh, between 1932 and 33, uh, where Stalin begins uh, issuing a series of edicts. Uh, that will culminate in a process whereby the Ukrainian borders are closed uh, and food is stripped from the public. And the figures vary, but it's somewhere between three and about 4.8 million people uh, who are going to die uh, in about a year in a very brutal process of sort of compelling compliance uh, that is undertaken. Uh, now, I, of course, uh, don't speak Ukrainian, uh, but my understanding, of course, is that this action, uh, which was, you know, kept secret and, you know, we could certainly have discussions as to whether or not it constituted a genocide on the part of the you know, Russians against the Ukrainians at that point, um, you know, is referred to as Holodomor, uh, this sort of great national terror that was undertaken. So I, I think about all of this when I think about sort of the resolve of the Ukrainian people now, uh, you know, sort of against what is ongoing. Uh, and then the other thing that I think about is is Germany and Switzerland, right? So there there is quite a great deal of news, right, that has been coming out over the last number of days, and it is hard to keep track of things. Uh, but Germany's decision uh, to increase its defense budgets. Uh, I think is a very significant turn uh, when it comes to the European Union uh, and the power dynamics of the early 21st century. Uh, and I think it was this morning or last night, uh, Switzerland announced it's going to be forsaking its neutrality uh, to begin seizing assets. And I go, if Switzerland's forsaking neutrality, that's a big deal. Uh, you know, that's a clear statement uh, when it comes to some of this. So those are the things that I'm thinking about or that are standing out to me right now. So thanks. Thank you, Josh and um, Jim McIntyre. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for the historical context because a lot of interestingly uh, for this all came became a shooting war, if you will, just as I was looking at a lot of material on the early Cold War and the Korean conflict. I'm pre preparing something for the fall of next year when I teach modern U.S. history. And so a lot of the thinking on containment, right, and expand, you know, Soviet expansion and uh, George Kennan, Mr. X, and, and just all that sort of those views of the former Soviet Union, you know, when it was the current Soviet Union, and what do we do about this? We're, we're kind of going through my head as uh, Russia moved into the Ukraine, and I, you know, I think a lot of this um, is also... Um, Thucydides, because I think he has a lot of answers for human conflict, you know, uh, for, I think for Putin, this is, you know, Thucydides says in his Pel history of the Peloponnesian War, conflict is about fear, honor, and interest. And I think all three of these, and, and, you know, my colleagues have kind of pointed this out already, um, that there's the fear that on, on one hand, there's the, the fear that Russia may not matter, 
you know, and, and, you know, numerous or several American politicians have recently and in the past referred to Russia as a gas station with an army. And I think, you know, part of the motivation is to demonstrate, no, we're actually a significant player, perhaps not a great power to the way the Soviet Union was, but don't discount us. Um, on the other hand, interest, you know, uh, regaining some of this territory, and as was pointed out by several of my colleagues, this has been part of Putin's agenda all along. And I do believe he's fairly transparent on all of this. Um, and he has been from the start. I mean, his doctoral dissertation was, was kind of the roadmap that he's followed ever since. So it's not like it's it's been this cloak and dagger thing. Um, and I think that there are moving forward, you know, assets and liabilities with that. On the one hand, um, even should he succeed in the Ukraine, I don't know that that would be a permanent shift in the state of affairs. I mean, what he's really accomplished has been, as um, Mary pointed out, you know, NATO was kind of looking for a reason to exist for a while. Well, now they have one again, and they're realizing it in Europe with or without strong, staunch U.S. support. Um, so that's happening. And it, it's never good to have, you know, uh, Germany expanding their military budget on, you know, because of you. Um, that's probably not what you probably not what he was hoping to achieve with all of this. Uh, so. You know, that's that's going to be a more of an enduring accomplishment, because even should he get the Ukraine, I mean, the, the reality is um, Putin is is getting, you know, he's not going to live forever. Um, consequently, what tends to happen when dictators like him pass from the scene is there's usually not someone equally as aggressive and astute and what have you because if they're rising if someone like that is rising up through the ranks in russia currently vladimir putin knows who they are and is trying to sideline them one way or another because they're a threat to him you know so we'll probably see a period where what he has accomplished while in power is is going to fade you know is going to fall apart um, and that's like a worst case scenario um, so I've talked about fear and a little bit about interest, you know, reestablishing parts of the old Russian borders and finally honor. And I think that one parses both ways, you know, again, it's restoration for the part of the Russians. And at the same time, I think that's, what's drawing NATO and, and the U S, you know, cause part of this gambit is if NATO can be made to look weak, um, and if Putin succeeds in the Ukraine, you know, I kind of think Xi Jinping is going to be taking notes and thinking about Taiwan. Um, so that's, you know, another part of this. And, and you know, that Putin and uh, Xi have been in communication. They, they have some kind of relationship. I wouldn't call it, you know, I'd call it an alliance the way I would call Rome and Berlin an alliance in 1940. You know, they're probably reading about each other's moves on social media as opposed to reading about the invasion of Poland in a newspaper, but not much, not much, not very far withdrawn. And I think that's probably five minutes, so I will stop now. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And, um, now I'll I'll give um, my two cents and um, then we'll we'll turn it over for questions and comments. So I think one thing that comes to mind I've I've heard a lot of people asking what Putin's goal is, and in my mind I think a, a big part of it is to limit the pro-liberal democracy openness trend that's been happening in Ukraine. I think back in 2014 there was a pro-Russian government in Ukraine, and they had finalized an association with the European Union. And uh, the, the previous president in Ukraine, under pressure from Putin, um, balked at that agreement. It led to mass protests in Ukraine, and a parliament, parliament essentially voted um, that, that president out of office. And that's really when you saw the first incursion of Russia um, forces into Crimea um, in, in Ukraine back in 2014. Um, so I agree with my colleagues, this is at least 30 years in the making. I think it's important. To, to look at Putin as an individual. He's a former KGB officer. He was stationed in Dresden during the fall of the Berlin Wall. He was humiliated and has deep resentment 
regarding the breakup of the Soviet Union, and I think it's been mentioned that he views it as the biggest geopolitical catastrophe in the past century um, of losing the former Soviet Union. And of course, Ukraine is the prize. It's um, key for economic security and cultural reasons. And I think as Ukraine has moved closer to the West and become more democratic, it's a, it's a threat to Putin um, and a threat to his regime. Democracy and protests, mass movements are all extremely threatening to Putin. He knows his own power could be taken away by free and fair elections in Russia. If he was voted out of office, his corruption could be exposed and he could be jailed or killed. Putin's very concerned about the protests that happened in Russia in 2011. Um, they essentially had rigged elections in Russia. Many people went out into the streets. There was cell phone videos showing how rigged this election was. and. Um, Secretary Clinton at the time, uh, Secretary of State Clinton um, helped, uh, according to Putin, he believed that um, um, Clinton helped inspire these protests. Um, Clinton had said something to the effect that the Russian people deserve to have their, their voices heard. And I think for him, um, you know, the fact that uh, Ukraine had had two kind of demo democrat democratic revolutions, if you will, essentially in 2004 and 2014, um, where, where Putin's preferred candidate had lost and uh, pro-democracy kind of pro-West candidates had won. I think that was enough. And, um, you know, that the U.S. had kind of crossed the line in interfering in Russia's uh, sphere of influence. And, and as I said earlier, that's really when the pro-Russian forces got involved in annexing Crimea and parts of the Donbass. Um, so um, I believe that... Um, this was the ideal time for him to invade Ukraine and topple the government to try to ensure that he could control the trajectory of Ukraine to be more aligned with Russia. Uh, why now? Uh, in international relations, one of the classes I teach, there's a framework that uses a systemic level of analysis to understand and explain events. Imagine looking at the world in the widest possible lens um, with, um, we call this a systemic level of analysis. And for the past two decades, we're arguably in, in a waning kind of unipolar moment in an emerging um, multipolar system with the rising China, uh, the US uh, in a more, the United States being number two um, or the second major superpower, and then kind of an emerging more active regional power in Russia. Um, they've been had three separate annexations of foreign territory in addition to Ukraine, they had Georgia, um, and then also they've been heavily involved militarily in Syria. So invading Ukraine in the manner in which they did is a major escalation, but in, in other ways, it's also an extension of their aggressive foreign policy over the past years, as the United States has retreated globally due to preoccupation and, and two decades of war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the United States focus on Iran's nuclear program. So after you know the past two decades, like I mentioned, the United States is more of an exhausted superpower. There's little appetite for the American public for taking on the nuclear power in Russia. Uh, NATO's been having an identity crisis, particularly under the Trump administration, where he questioned whether the United States should stay in the organization. Um, and then uh, in Europe, I think if you look around, you know, France has got upcoming elections in April. In the UK, there's been a lot of turmoil. Bert, Boris Johnson's struggling. Germany just had a new chancellor, so I think Putin assumed that there wouldn't be a coordinated action amongst the allies to stop him. Um, and, and of course, much of Europe is heavily reliant on natural gas and oil from Russia. And um, I'll, I'll throw in my final minute here from an individual level of analysis. I think it's really important to understand that Putin is insecure. He's paranoid of democracy, mass movements and regime changes. Um, the 2003 Iraq war, um, where the United States essentially helped regime change, um, the Bush's freedom agenda of promoting democracy abroad, the color revolutions in Eastern Europe, 2003 to 2005. So that would be the Rose revolution in Georgia, the orange in Ukraine and the t tulip in Kyrgyzstan. Of course, the Arab spring in 2011. Uh, particularly Egypt um, and um, Gaddafi in um, Libya, how he was brutally killed. Um, this uh, allegedly that Putin has watched that video repeatedly. And I think he worries that he could be next and he's going to do whatever he can to prevent that from happening. Um, so 
that's, I think, my five minutes and uh, be happy uh, to, you know, for, for all of us to be taking questions and comments now. Um, I don't see anything in, in the chat, but if any individual there are questions, Kevin, there are, there are two questions. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Do you see him in the Q and A? I'm looking right now. One from um, Deb Stoffreken. Hers was the first one. She said she asked why right now, and then a second one from Dwight Floyd. Would the limited access to SWIFT really stop their exports and imports? Uh, please speak to the impact of their overall economy. Well, I I think the, the the right now part for me, and I'd be happy to start it, is is similar to, to you know basically what I was just saying about the the moment globally that this it, there seemed to be a window of opportunity. Now that being said, I think this started you know last January or so where he started uh, making military plans. I think this has been in the works for several months, close to a year. Um, but I think the the global moment was you know that. The United States just pulling out of Afghanistan would probably be unlikely to uh, to confront them, and and just whether the allies and NATO and European Union would be able to um, work together to be able to um, have sanctions that had teeth. Um, so I think the the global moment for him, I think he 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 thought this was the time to act. But I'll I'll turn it over to to the to the rest of the panel. As far as the second question goes, I'm not sure if anybody is, is if you have more knowledge about this than I do about SWIFT. Um, I was just going to explain to the audience like that SWIFT is like basically the the routing number of a bank, right? So if you're transferring number transferring money overseas to a bank, like you have to have their to an international bank, it's their their SWIFT number that's issued. Um, and so the, the idea that that some of the the major Russian banks um, SWIFT access is being cut off. As far as they're stopping their exports and imports, I really can't speak to that. But I will say that it is significant enough the idea that that they're even calling that into question at all. Initially, that was not even going to be considered. And now that that is being considered, that is considerable, along with the um, um, Swiss uh, sanctions that that Josh mentioned earlier. I mean, this, this is a pretty big deal. This is a bigger response, I think, than Putin was ever considering. I think this spiraled beyond beyond his his um, anything that he was he was possibly thinking, um, and I want to well I'll I'll wait because there are a couple of things I want to add as well. But I, there's so many questions coming in, so I want to uh, I'll stop. If anyone else wants to chime in on the the Swift question, please feel free to. Well, I I think that you know in in combination with everything, the Swift payments, the bank, the um, the bank, um, the actions they've taken on limiting uh, the Russian banks, um, all of the sanctions. Um, you know, we, we've seen the the ruble has, I think, declined by forty percent just in the last day. They had to shut off their stock market. Um, you know, I think it was kind of Lisa Rice yesterday that was saying that she hasn't seen this level of cooperation amongst NATO since the Cold War. I mean, it's just, it's, I don't think Putin could have imagined that there'd be this much uh, coordinated action. And it's clearly having, you know, there's, if you look at the videos, there's people making runs on the ATM in Russia. Um, they had to raise the interest rate um, to 20% in Russia to try to keep um, an incentive for people to, to keep their money in the bank. So I think, you know, all of this is really positive. I can't stress that enough, but it's also really concerning to me that as Putin, as he's you know put his nuclear forces on high alert, is somebody who might be backed in the corner of, of how he's going to respond to this, um, whether it's cyber activities, whether it's shutting off natural gas to, to Europe, or whether it's it's taking nuclear action. And there's a there's a question about that in the chat, about whether this could be World War Three and and. You know, as much as I wouldn't have thought of that a week ago, I, I think that there's this is really, really concerning and we certainly can't rule any of that out. Um, so I've spoken too much. So I'm going to turn over back to my colleagues. Yeah, I um, think. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm kind of skeptical that SWIFT is going to work. Um, SWIFT is one system that many banks use, but China has its own and Russia can just easily pivot over to China. Russia has been hoarding foreign currency reserves for a long time, almost in a way that they were expecting this. 
And the other thing is the price of the ruble drops, which means that Russian exports have become cheaper. Right now, the price of wheat is at a 14 year high. The price of oil is at $90 a barrel. These are things that the world is looking for. Russia can provide them. And since the value of the ruble has dropped so much, all of a sudden Russian exports are very, very cheap. In a way, this is almost counterproductive. It's making Russian exports more easily able to get to market as long as you go through China, which right now China's playing a game which it seems like they're kind of oto botoing it on the one hand, but on the other hand, they're very clearly not siding with the Western world with this, even with the verisimilitude that they are. As far as why right now, the first question, I think Putin didn't want to lose face. Uh, it was clear that there were activities as far as whether or not Ukraine wanted to get fast passed into NATO in about April. In September, Putin said, if that happens, we're gonna have problems. And NATO said, well, that's up to Ukraine. And I don't think he was ready for that. I don't think he was ready for some pushback on it. And as a result, I think he's kind of playing in uncharted territory right now. I'm not sure that given especially how their military has been working right now, that Putin really thought a lot of this through. But I don't know. I'll shut up now. No, I would agree with what most of folks are saying. Um, I was just going to comment on the, um, I guess, just, you know, the question of, uh, you know, is, is World War III, you know, going to, you know, kind of result from, from all of this. And, you know, when it comes to the, and it comes to the question of the idea of how valid should we take sort of Putin's nuclear threats and sort of all this stuff. And, you know, most of the analysis I'm sure everybody else has seen is that, the common phrase is, well, you know, and if it comes to that, cooler heads will prevail. Will they? I mean, well, you know, do, do I think that it is absolute zero chance of, you know, most nations with nuclear power have their forces generally on alert anyway. Uh, of, so the idea that they're on alert doesn't necessarily concern me. Um, the thing that concerns me is Belarus renouncing its nu non-nuclear status so that the nukes can be moved in. Th that shows potential intent, uh, and that then thus becomes concerning. So do I think it's a zero chance that something's going to happen? No. Do I think the chances are a little bit more likely? Could be. Um, you know, I think the question of should we give validity to sort of Putin's threat? In some ways, yeah. I mean, I think that if anything, um, you know, as our, my colleagues have said over the last uh, number of years, you know, for the most part, he's been pretty clear about what he's going to do, and then he goes and does it. Uh, and so it, it is at least something that um, as NATO and as the EU factor and game out the level of assistance that they're going to provide and how far we're going to take this, um, we need to sort of factor in, in fact, you know, the idea of how far the Russians are going to take it as well. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, the thing that concerns or that, that I find interesting over the last couple of days is... I, I don't think that the Russian army anticipated that it would endure this level of loss in this quick of time. Uh, you know, if you look at sort of ground conflict over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, and so then the question then becomes, how much loss are they prepared? How much risk are they prepared to take, right? So how much of the army are you going to commit here? Uh, versus how much, you know, um, you know, w whether or not you might sort of release nuclear weapons. Um, you know, and I think the, the reality is that we don't know, uh, and that in and of itself becomes very concerning. As far as the chances of World War III, because, you know, that's something that I've heard from a lot of yeah. friends and family and saying the same thing, concern. 
I, I don't really share that concern, but at the same time, I've been wrong about so many other things lately that, <laughs> I mean, I could be wrong about this too, so who knows? But um, I, I mean, in, and I'm going to kind of tie that question into the question about the U.S. having something to gain from involve, being involved in this conflict. So right now, as it stands, the United States, I mean, is not going to be entering into anything unless there's an attack on a NATO country. Now, we do have that one map that I had up shows that we have troops stationed right now in NATO countries that are are the ones that were, you know, Poland, um, um, Hungary, Romania, et cetera, um, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Now, if Putin were, there has been, I've read in several articles, I don't know, again, I would have said that the Putin of yesteryear is more of a rational actor. I would not have taken him, um, I, the idea that he would be possibly going after um, Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania, because I know that there's fear in those countries um, that he might going, be going after them next. That would be a serious escalation of this conflict. Um, and that, so that would be question, that would be countries one, two, and three. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so if he were to, let's say, to, to make a move against them, um, that would be that would be invoking Article Five of, of the NATO Charter, which would that would then compel all NATO members to jump to the aid of those countries. Now that aid can be in many different forms. That aid could be in in the form of provide allowing you know like airspace could be allowing um, just you know giving well, like the Germans giving their helmets, uh, for example, things things of that nature, um, or it could be actual active active force. Now, do I think that he would do that? I I don't think he would. Um, and I think even a cornered Putin knows, I mean, because he, he, as Kevin mentioned earlier, he wants to hold on to what he has. Um, and he is extremely paranoid about losing what he has. And if you see what he's been doing over the last 20 years, with an, he's been basically centralizing power. Because if you looked at the, at the Russian constitution that was put into, into, into um, effect when the Soviet Union ended, um, power, there was an attempt to decentralize power. Um, and, and basically try to extend the, this, the notion of, of, of freedoms, of, of media freedoms. He's been in, taking those away year after year after year. Um, journalists, one after the other, have been, have been murdered in these mysterious circumstances. Um, you know, there, there's been this, you know, um, and there's been where he can go and take, a, take control of a place, he, can, he will. So Chechnya is one example where we went in, they went in the first time under, under Boris Yeltsin in the 1990s. Um, pulled out. That was a scene as a massive humiliation under Putin. They went back in um, and now have this sort of devil's bargain with them where the um, the Chechens are under this, this the rule of this horrific um, autocrat who's kind of made this bargain with Putin that allows him to stay in power and in and, and return is um, committing horrible human rights atrocities against his own people. Um, but I, I don't see that happening right now because that, that just seems to be totally out of character for him unless he's lost his mind. Um, which I, 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 again, don't see that happening. Um, I don't see him going after Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. That would be signaling something that would just be irrevocable. He can't turn back from that. Um, and he's too paranoid to go back from that. I do want to mention a couple of things just from, from a, a side note. I had the opportunity to go to Russia in 2006 on a Fulbright scholarship with a group of faculty from, um, from the area. And we had the opportunity to visit a, um, a former gulag camp. And for those of you who are, are a little bit familiar, Gulag camp was basically a concentration camp that uh, from the time of Stalin onward, um, they held Russian dissidents. I mean, for you know, you could be jaywalking and get thrown into a Gulag camp at different points in Russian history during the communist era. And this particular Gulag was in um, the Ural Mountains area. It was known as Perm 36. And basically, um, they were they were they turned into a museum and it was the only one that was left um, of these Gulags that was that had not been destroyed. Um, and I just want to, I want to throw it out there to let you all know, to give you an idea of where we're at, where Putin's mind is at. That museum has been closed um, as of two, 2014. He has maintained all along that history should be positive. And any mention or any kind of like mentioning of, of, of Russia being the aggressor and Russia being the bad guy is just not the image that he wants to project. So this place where you, you could walk around and smell the wood that literally smells like fresh wood, even when I was there in 2006, because this was open still up until almost 1990, this camp. Um, has now been closed and it's the only one that's left. So, so what does that tell you about, about what's going on there? Um, it, it was, it's, it, it's very scary. And just six months after we came back from there, a journalist that, that had been covering, um, Russian atrocities. And again, this is 2006, so it's been a while, but nothing, not much has changed. If I think it's accelerated, um, a particular Russian journalist was murdered, uh, after we came back and she's one of many. Alexei Navalny, an opposition leader to who's been very vocal to to Putin, um, is is back and is in prison, very very ill, um, and has now been resentenced. Like I think he's been given another what 15 year term, uh, Kevin, if I'm incorrect on that, uh, correct me please. 
Um, and so any, any type of opposition to him, he's going to squelch. So I kind of wonder if perhaps the opposition that he's seeing at home that I think is taking him by surprise, um, even what I loved anonymous, the hacking, uh, group is now going after, after Russia internally. Um, I think all that kind of internal it might kind of make him turn inward. He's gonna have to find a way to extract himself from this by saving face. Cause of course that's his, that's his, his first and foremost, um, concern, but I don't see him expanding this further, but I've been wrong so many times that, you know, who knows I could be wrong again. So with that, I'll, <laughs> I'll stop. I, I know Jim lost contact there for a little bit with his connection. So Jim, um, welcome back. And, uh, Thank you. just wanted to give you an opportunity to catch up if there was something that you wanted to say that you weren't able to say earlier. Uh, no, really. I just wanted to, uh, build on what Mary was saying. I think, yeah, if Putin needs the quick victory, if this protracts, it really, um, because as, as was pointed out earlier, you know, the Russian military, like you basically have three choices generally you can make with your military establishment, small and elite, medium and moderate, or large and not really good. And he's got option three. Um, and, and that plus the idea that when, if they get into an insurgency and counterinsurgency in the Ukraine, two things are going to happen. The multinational arena is going to be even more opposed to him than it already is, because those are particularly ugly conflicts to put, to put down. And two, it, let's be honest, in, in the counterinsurgency work that Russia has done, that even in Chechnya, where it, kind of looks like a win it's only a win because they found someone who would who they could back internally like if they're if this was a, a you know going back to the days of imperialism which is a lot of putin's thought if this was like some kind of you know russian vice royalty there would still be an insurgency in chechnya um so i think it either way he it, it's it's going to have to end soon. And, and I agree with, with some kind of face saving or just some kind of negotiated piece because protraction is really not going to be in either side's favor. That's all. So there's a lot of questions. Um, I think just going sequentially here, um, the significance of referring to Ukraine versus the Ukraine. Well, in Ukrainian and in Russian, there's no word for the. So if you were going to say, I am an American, you would say, yeah, American, it's I American. So articles aren't really a thing that are, are big with that. Uh, people that are Ukrainian tend to be upset when it's referred to the Ukraine because the Ukraine was something that refers to its Soviet past. So um, there's a lot of things that Americans have to like unburden themselves with, like, Ukrainians prefer to call it Kiev as opposed to Kiev, um, Kharkiv as opposed to Kharkov, and Ukraine as opposed to the Ukraine. So as far as like what would be understood in Ukrainian, it's the same, but it, it's one of those things that when they hear it said in English, it's referring back to a period when they were in the Soviet sphere of influence, and they really don't want to go back to that, not even the Russian speakers for the most part. 67% of, of Ukraine speaks Russian, but only about maybe 16 or 17 percent are ethnically Russian to speak of. Not gonna shut up. But I could talk about World War III and nukes. Go ahead. I'm. I think that there's a greater chance of World War III happening with this than than maybe some of you. I I don't mean to disagree. One of the things that every American school kid learns is that the Cold War was between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and we didn't really didn't fight that much. But what every Russian school kid learns is that America did invade the Soviet Union in 1918 through 1920 when it was at its weakest. And Russian school kids don't forget that. The reason that I think we're in this is because of the failure of the Budapest Accord in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. Ukraine did that as a response for territorial agreements that Russia and the United States would preserve Ukraine's territorial integrity. Ukraine gives up its nuclear weapons, which thankfully it did, and all of a sudden, Ukraine gets invaded. Putin's watching this video of Gaddafi over and over. What does Gaddafi have to do with this? Gaddafi gave up his nuclear weapons too. 
if Ukraine had nukes, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Ukraine would be a territorial integritist. Is that a word? It'd be a country that wouldn't have been invaded by Russia. So, okay, now I can shut up. Um, well, I, I too share your concern that this, this definitely has um, a stronger possibility of, 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 of ending up in World War III or nuclear weapons than, than um, you know, it's certainly not a, a, a small, it, it, it's a much larger percentage chance than it was a week or two ago, for sure. Um, does the United States have anything to gain from involvement in this conflict? Well, Kosovo just joined NATO, or they want to join NATO. That's new. As far as financial interests, I don't know. Some wars you don't fight because you win. Some wars you fight because you don't want to lose. I think that's one reason also that the chance of World War III is greater is that I don't think America has a real strong appetite to send soldiers into Ukraine or into the Sawalki Gap in Lithuania, kind of like keeping the Baltic states in line with, with the rest of NATO. And I think Putin knows that. Every time that he's tried to invade somebody, he's gotten a slap on the wrist. And he may very well be saying, well, just because you're in NATO, that doesn't mean you have to send soldiers in. You could send in helmets, or you could send thoughts and prayers, or you can send other things. So. I don't know. I, I don't see him necessarily stopping because of some concerted allied effect by NATO because it hasn't been tested yet. And I don't know if America is ready to send soldiers halfway over to fight the Russians. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, that would depend on who's president here, what's happening internally. But I do still, I mean, if there were to be a, a the type of invasion on the scale that's occurring in the Ukraine right now in somewhere like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, we could not just, I, I do not see the United States, if certainly if it was under the Biden administration right now, um, just avoiding Article 5 and saying, oh, sorry, we're, we're just going to send helmets. We would not be, I mean, we're the largest weapons uh, donor to NATO. I mean, without without the United States, NATO doesn't do all that much. Um, so I don't I don't see, although at the same time, I will also, maybe I'm going to contradict myself in the same, the same sentence. We're seeing kind of a rejection. It's interesting how the old wor world order, let's say, seems to be kind of shifting at this moment where... Because we're seeing countries like Russia use the UN Security Council um, as sort of like a, a way to sort of insulate themselves and play their games. Um, I mean, the, the whole point of the Security Council was to try to avoid conflict, right? To try to try to try to mitigate conflict and try to um, try to get parties to talk to one another. And yet, you know, here, here you have Russia with its veto power, which is able to kind of insulate itself from any kind of, kind of criticism, which is the same thing that happened back in the late '90s, which is why NATO intervened in Kosovo. Um, to begin with, or in Bosnia, I should say first, um, because the, the UN Security Council could not act. Um, I still am going to respectfully disagree with my colleagues, though, because I just, to me, that, that I, I'm not going to say that I would agree for sure. Are we closer to, to a nuclear type escalation or World War III than we were last week? Of course, no doubt. I don't think any of us were anticipating it to go to this level, but I just, I, I still say that regardless, um, I mean, Putin is not just going to just as crazy as some of this action might appear, he's not crazy. There is still, I mean, he's, he is a smart man and he's going to go. He, I think he's, like you said, he's, he's been testing the waters and I think he's been not anticipating that this was going to go as far as it was going to go and the reaction that he was going to get. And he's going to have to find some kind of way to allow him to save face. Once these talks occur now, they're supposed to be uh, occurring in Belarus. I think it's going to be interesting to see kind of what happens. Cause I think that in and of itself is an indication that, he is looking for a way out. The fact that he and 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 uh, and the Ukrainians don't want this to go on longer too. I mean, I think that that Zelensky's doing an awesome job of keeping morale up, and the things that he's been saying are quite inspiring and and um, and, and admirable. But how long do they have? How long can they keep can they keep up such a protracted fight? Um, you know, I, I just read an article about 10, 10 soldiers joining like this foreign legion that that he's proposing in in, in the Ukraine. That's 10 soldiers. That's awesome. But is that enough to get him where he wants to be? Um, I don't know. But perhaps all this action, though, this, there is so much collective action. It's not just one thing. I think it's one thing that, that perhaps, at least for me, I was not expecting all of these things to happen. Because at first it was like the sports stuff, right? It was the soft stuff. But now we're getting into the harder stuff, the banking stuff. And if you do want to hurt someone, you hurt them in your purse. That's where people really get hurt in their wallets. 
Um, and so if that does, if that were to continue longer, and if if oligarchical power um, in, in, and money in Russia is threatened, you're going to see a pushback against against Putin himself. Um, and then you will see him back down, because I don't, don't think he's going to take, take that risk for himself. But again, what do I know? <laughs> well, <laughs> and we, every time I say that, with what do I know? <laughs> we're all rooting for your your scenario to play out, Mary. <laughs> I know I just, um, you know, James Clapper, former CIA agent, our leader of the CIA, director of the CIA, you know, he had just kind of remarked about the way that Putin, Putin had changed in, in the way that his communication has been much more emotional or much more erratic than in the past. And so, again, I, I hope you're right, but I don't, I think we're all speculating, you know, we can, we can um, go off of some, we, we're not in his head. Um, we can't exactly know. Um, and again, but, we're, we haven't, sorry, Kevin, we haven't discussed the power of the oligarchs in, in that country. And so it is not as he does act very unilaterally, but it's not as though he could just act completely with impunity in the, as though there are no checks on him whatsoever. I mean, this grand bargain that he's made with people there where he's made them money, but if that money gets threatened, that is going to, that, that is going to threaten him in turn. Does the U.S. have anything to gain from involvement in the conflict? I know I, I mentioned that earlier. I know um, we, we touched on that a little bit. I think another way of framing that, Nick, um, who asked that question, is we have a lot to lose. The West has a lot to lose. I think this is a really pivotal, you know, when I said Cold War 2.0 um, in, in, um, in an article that the newspaper recently did in the Glacier, which I thought was excellent, by the way, if, if you get a chance to check that out. Um, this is really the new fault line of the Cold War, I think, of of democracy versus authoritarianism. And I think it's been clear that Putin has gotten involved in places like Georgia and Ukraine um, and Belarus at moments when they start to become a little bit more democratic. And so I think that, um, you know, if you care about democracy, if you could, if, if you care about, you know, borders being uh, having integrity and mattering, you know, of of sovereignty, you know, a, a, a state having sovereignty. This this there's a lot to lose um, from the precedent of this. And of you know, it was mentioned earlier that China's watching how how this unfolds, and if um, you know they're they're able to get away with this and and just take over Ukraine, then then that has implications for for China and and for for Taiwan and um, other places as well. But uh, colleagues, I really want to believe that the peace treaty talks are being done in earnest. But when South Ossetia, the violence in South Ossetia occurred, Putin almost immediately said he wants talks. He wants talks, and he dragged him out, dragged him out, dragged him out, dragged him out further and further to give this appearance that he was looking for peace. When at the entire time he was just continuing to fight, and eventually they did sign him six months later, I think. So I, I worry that he's proposing talks disingenuously. Absolutely. But again, I think the the issue there becomes one of he it might be deception is at the heart of it, but again, as it protracts, is that something that is going to benefit? Like already he's made some major miscalculations and and it's blowing back on on his regime. So therefore, you know, it, it could do just the same, the following the same gambit once again, because it honestly, I give, I give Ukrainian leadership a lot of credit at each stage in this. They seem to have done a very good job of looking at what Putin has done in Chechnya and in Ossetia in these other areas and being prepared for it. Like I really appreciated Saturday when they uh, announced, you know, 24 seven curfew in Kyiv, uh, but then told the people, look, we're just doing this because we know there are Russian sleeper cells. You're not supposed to know there are Russian sleeper cells, you know, like, like they've, they've kind of figured out, or, or at least if not anticipated, planned on the contingency for a lot of possibilities. So, and again, this happens again, often in history where okay, the playbook works once, but then you go to it the third or fourth time and your opponents are going, yeah, we, we read that and we're taking countermeasures already. And, and so it could, again, backfire on them following, following the same 
gambits he's used in the past. And again, you run into a problem where it becomes more and more difficult to invent. You know, if it's worked already, then why try something new? And and that could be a trap he's falling into at this point. Uh, combining two questions, um, do you think there's that countries like Germany and Britain will try to help Ukraine despite relying on Russia for oil? And when I said combining two, I think related to that, in spite of all this, why is gas still flowing through North Stream 1? Josh, I think you're muted. Hmm. Everybody's muted. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jason. Sweet. I could talk if you want. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Germany, well, Germany has a financial interest in Russia. And it's one of those things that, well, I, I guess, in spite of all this, why is gas still flowing through Nord Stream 1? Well, because Russia is still providing it and because Germany's still buying it. And there's a lot of ambiguity with this, I think, where nobody likes to see Russia taking over countries and expanding its sphere of influence. But at the same time, I still don't see the appetite for doing the things necessary to counter Putin. Sanctions are great, but sanctions, have they ever worked before? Do we think these are going to work? I'm not sometimes I'm I'm kind of skeptical. I don't know. Well, yeah, I you know, I the Europe is very reliant on gas natural gas uh from from Russia and you know, this to kind of put this in connect a few dots here. I I think it was last month I was reading an article about in Italy, you know, people for a small apartment were paying over $800 a month for heating costs. And, you know, um, we can all talk tough about what needs to be done with, with Russia, but even in the United States, you know, with people been complaining about gas prices for some time, you know, how much more willing are we to, to pay higher prices at the pump? So, you know, they're like people have to have their homes heated and, um, you know, many people are living, um, paycheck to paycheck. So it's tough to pay higher prices. So, you know, I think that, you know, it's countries like Germany and Britain are definitely going to do everything they, they can short of direct military action. Um, but um, there is always the chance that Russia could kind of sh uh, shut off the pipeline, so to speak. Is there any hope for Ukraine? Yeah. So one of the questions, is there any hope for Ukraine? I think um, right now, Russia's military is about a million soldiers. Of those 240,000 are conscripts. Those conscripts are only there for a year and then they go home. And there's also a, a provision in the Russian constitution that says the conscripts aren't allowed to go to a battlefield. One of the first things that happened right before this military operation of Putin is they took that out so they could go there. Um, Russia spends 10 times the military budget that Ukraine does. But I think there's always hope. I think that there's things that could happen in the future that would bring NATO in. I think that Russia's supply lines are iffy. I think it's thought of having three different fronts seemed like a good idea, except that means that those three fronts now don't have what's called military science interior lines. That is that Ukraine is easier to, I see Jim laughing about that one. Uh, that means that Ukraine can supply its soldiers as they get further into the country as they can. Right now, Ukraine has a lot to be positive about. Uh, the European Union just said that it was sending half a billion dollars in military aid and in fighter planes. The fact that Russia hasn't been able to gain air superiority yet is a significant problem for it. I don't know. I, I don't think, uh, speaking like 
uh, with my colleagues. If you asked me what was going on a month ago, I wouldn't have said any of this would have happened. So a month from now, who knows what will happen in Ukraine, I think. I think there's definitely hope. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. I, I think, thank you. I think that um, that there's a lot of hope for Ukraine. Um, while social media might seem kind of vacuous, and it is <laughs> in many ways, um, I think the outpouring of support for them, the constant, that does translate sometimes into more um, uh, tangible things. Uh, even like the, the the Russian tennis star writing, often if you guys saw it, wrote, he wrote uh, no more war on the on the screen. Like after after he was, I can't forget the gentleman's name escapes me, but he was a, um, a lot of the Russian sports stars. Had, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they've been very vocal about about openly supporting Ukraine. Even uh, one of the um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm names these days elude me, so I'm not even going to bother because I'm I'm terrible with names nowadays. But um, the daughter of one of the Russian uh, ministers actually got on TV and also or was on social media, I believe, and, and also said something about um, a pro-Ukrainian um, um, comment. These, again, might seem like minor things, but the whole world is pretty much with the Ukraine at this moment. And and I can't remember, if Kevin, if you said earlier, when we've last seen such an outpouring of unity, um, and, and, and although China, of course, you know, China and Russia, the, the whole are we, aren't we on and off relationship that we have go, all going on, um, he loves me, he loves me not thing happening all these years, um, China's not giving 100 full throttle support to to Russia on this. You know, they're, they're kind of, they're holding back a little bit. They abstained, of course, in the Security Council thing. That's not shocking. Um, but I think there's always concerns that, that I think that, that I think that they are also taken aback by the amount of support that Ukraine is getting. Um, you know, Ukraine is not, is not Crimea. I mean, it's not, I mean, Crimea is, you know, is, is a tiny, obviously, little part of it. But I'm saying Ukraine's much bigger. Um, looking at, um, um, Chechnya, excuse me, I meant to say Ukraine is not Chechnya. Chechnya is much smaller. Ukraine is much larger. To subdue a country like the Ukraine and risking a, a protracted conflict that could drag on for years and years and years is not in Russia's best interest. Um, and, and Ukraine, even for its on and off, like with its, its pro-Russian governments that it's had, it's largely enjoyed for the most part, right? More, certainly more democracy than Russia enjoyed for the past 20 years. So to tell them that, hey, it's all over with now, you're done, I don't think it's going to be as easy as, as they as they think. And so I, I think that there is a lot of hope um, um, for the Ukraine at this moment. And and it's I've actually enjoyed, oddly enough, watching all of the, the support, um, whether it's from, I mean, again, vacuous, but movie stars, you know, writing things about it, or even the, the guy from Dancing with the Stars, who's in the Ukraine at the moment. Um, but who's who's there and who's who's writing about what's happening to him as he's there? I think that and and social media is providing us a, a look that we would never normally get, right? And um, um a, in 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 your face, moment by moment depiction of what's happening there on the ground. Um, or Zelensky saying, you know, don't give me a ride, give me weapons. I just I, I think that there's a lot of 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 public support. And I think there's a lot of hope for it. I, I don't see that uh, that waning anytime soon. So, Jim and Josh. Yeah, um, just to clarify, because it, it's like the interior lines thing, it just because what what essentially Russia is doing is placing the entire population of the Ukraine or of Ukraine, whatever, on dead ground, right? Like fight or die, uh, fight or be taken. Uh, so I think that that's, you know, and again, the further in they push, the more dangerous it's going to be. Like Sun Tzu says, never do this, right? Always give your opponent, if, if, they're, if they're backs against the wall, always give them a way out. And that's not really happening. So I think, again, it, it's not, this is, this is not a case that's in Putin's favor um, at all. And yes, the, the worse it gets, like the, the tragic part of this is, almost in the short term, the worse it, it looks on all the media, the better for the Ukraine, because it just, you know, solidifies international opposition. And at some point you do reach a tipping point with that. It's, it's very easy to step back and say, well, Putin, this won't matter, but it will. And as Mary pointed out, you know, uh, at a certain point, it may not matter to Vladimir Putin, but it matters to the oligarchs. And if he loses them, then he's in real trouble. Uh, because they're essentially the backbone of his support. Without them, he's really kind of hanging. 
So I think that there's, you know, and it is heartening that there is that. And, and again, I keep going back to the idea that I think, you know, this is something that has just been really miscalculated um, by Vladimir Putin, and he's hopefully, if he if he is still a rational actor, he's coming to that realization, um, and will you know try to pull back um, before before any of these things get really bad, any worse for him or for his country as well. Josh? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, good, good. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I have hope for Ukraine as well. Uh, you know, but most of my comments would build on what many others have said, but the things that I'm sort of looking at is uh, sort of a couple of things. One, yeah, the, the pace of how things have gone over the last few days, the amount of casualties, the amount of destruction that the Russians have been taking. Uh, and I, I think like what uh, Professor Fifelis was saying, Duck was saying earlier, um, you know, in, initiative matters, you know, initiative can matter a great deal. And, you know, what I was saying earlier with the, the famine and things like that in, in, in you know, Ukraine uh, back in the early 1930s of there is a longstanding initiative uh, and you're seeing it play out in uh, the, the popular support that exists in Ukraine uh, at this particular moment and across Europe, uh, especially uh, against the Russians and again, particularly against Putin and what the army is is doing. Uh, the, you know, I, I find it so fascinating, certainly, uh, you know, given, you know, President Zelensky's former uh, sort of, you know, media career and everything everything else i think i we saw it was it yesterday that he was the uh uh the translation voice for paddington bear in ukraine you know sort of this kind of thing uh of you know but he's someone who understands the value of media within this and especially in these early days and the clear um you know sort of uh sort of real effect that how he is constructing an image in the middle of all of this is paying genuine dividends, not only just within his country, but also globally. So yes, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I think none of us would really know what's going to happen, but yeah, I'm hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. I would share the same optimism as my colleagues. They're facing a, you know, a huge army with uh, nuclear powered Russia, but you know, one of the um, statements that, Putin had given right before the invasion about Ukraine not being, a, you know, a country and made up and all of that drivel. Um, the the sense of nationalism now in Ukraine, um, you know, he is. If, if it somehow wasn't a country before, which it clearly was, um, he has in, ignited their nationalism to a level that um, has, they've never had before, perhaps. And then. You know, morale um, matters so much in fighting, and I'm certainly not a, a, war, a war historian, and, and this is not my area of, of expertise, but when you see, you know, um, people just, uh, people who work in the white collar jobs who are making Molotov cocktails and going to pick up their AK-47 from the uh, from down the street to defend their country and saying goodbye to their, you know, kids and and spouse, um, I think that really matters. And, and I just see zero hope for Russia to somehow install some puppet um, aligned with Russia to take over Ukraine. I just don't think that's ever going to work. Um, and then the international network where, you know, you can literally donate money to the Ukrainian army. And, um, you know, the others have mentioned the resolve of um, um, NATO and U European Union sending um, NATO led countries sending military supplies. So um, there, there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful. It's concerning, as concerning as the situation is. Um, and one question that comes up a lot um, in the media, and I know we're down to like our final minute, so I think we should probably end with this. Um, should there be a NATO having a no fly zone over Ukraine? Well, I think NATO just said that they're not going to. Um, I was just checking the news. Uh, and they, they said that they're they're not they've ruled it out. Uh, should they? 
Maybe, but the question is the escalation of what does that signal to Putin and what are the possible sort of reverberations from something like that? Is that something that could have a genuine benefit in the moment in stabilizing the Ukrainian sort of process and force and gives them the ability to get resupplied from what the EU is doing? Absolutely. But the process of defending it, the process of implementing it, uh, you're, you know, who's going to do that? Who are the, you know, who, which nations are going to be overseeing that, right? Is it going to be American pilots based in, you know, what is that going to look like? Um, you know, that would potentially escalate this in a whole new way. Uh, and uh, so there's good and bad with something like that. But I believe NATO just said that they've ruled it out. Uh, so, you know, now it's sort of a question of, okay, well, what else, you know, what else do we do? So. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. I, I think that um, if you, if a plane gets shot down, uh, you know, if you're trying to enforce the no-fly zone, I mean, you're effectively involved. I mean, that's, that's not a, a neutral action. And I think at this point that that's all but all but been ruled out, or effectively it has been ruled out according to Josh. Any other final comments uh, from the participants? Any closing thoughts? Um, I could talk about um, Dwight Floyd's question about the right wing and white supremacists in Russia real quick. Oh yeah, sure. I missed that. One of the things about Ukraine is after the Holodomor is when the Nazis came through in 1941, they originally viewed them as potentially being liberators from the Soviet threat. And they very quickly discovered that that wasn't how it was going to be at all. They were going to be just as bad, the Nazis, if not worse. And both countries have this weird, bizarre thing with neo-Nazi members. When I was in Russia, I certainly saw neo-Nazis just running around here and there. And it confused me because how do you do that when you don't know your history? One of the things that Putin said was he needed to denazify Ukraine, which is a strange statement because Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, is Jewish. How are you a country that's infested with neo-Nazis and have a Jewish president? I don't know. So I, I feel like both countries accuse the other of being fascist and of being neo-Nazi. I I don't know. If they're both accusing each other of being Nazis, I, I don't know. You know? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that was I was gonna say the same thing, Jason. And the other thing I just think that that once this is over, I think there needs to be a discussion. Um and I don't think it will happen, but I think there should be a discussion. Uh, within the United Nations about the role of the Security Council and the outdated modal of the Security Council. Um, and, and having Russia on there as a permanent member, uh, when Russia just kind of assumed the role um, as it was brought up um, after the Soviet Union collapsed, it assuming the role of all these other countries that are no longer on there as the Soviet Union. Um, and also perhaps discuss, discussing, perhaps expanding the role of the Security Council, no longer just having, you know, the, the rotating members, but having more permanent members um, because I, I think that just any time it, it's, it, it, it highlights the inaction, the inability of the Security Council to act when there is a problem. And this is the same exact thing that happened um, when the former Yugoslavia broke up in, with both Bosnia and with Kosovo in the 90s. Uh, it ended up compelling, if you will, um, NATO to take action, uh, which just goes to show you, to, J to Josh's point, NATO can act whenever it wants to. Right. I mean, if it unilaterally wants to decide to say that we're going to go ahead and create a no fly zone over the Ukraine, it can. It just is not going to. Um, so when it wants to, it will, because it did so multiple times in the 90s, but it's just not going to now. So um, anyway, that's those are my two thoughts. But that's I think that definitely bears um, discussion. And once again, always a pleasure to be with you guys. Likewise, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, putting this together at the last minute and and um, sharing your expertise and time. And thanks to all of you who uh, joined us today. And uh, you know, we will share this recording uh, on campus as soon as it's available. Thank you all for participating.